take your Bibles this morning and let's go to the book of Romans. The book of Romans chapter 1 is where we're going to get started this morning. And I want to preach on this subject that we find throughout the scripture in various places. And that is this thought, always be ready. Always be ready. You know, that is the, that is the theme of the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts, that they, uh, kind of their motto is to always be prepared, always be ready. You never know what's going to uh, what's going to happen or will come down the road and face you and always be ready. I think that is a, uh, a great motto and thought for us as believers, we that are saved, our Christians, is to always be ready. The Bible does talk about that in several places. So this morning, we are going to uh, move around in several different places and several different scripture here and think about that and think what the Bible says about that thought of being ready. Christians should be ready. You know, we are, <clears throat> we are involved in a spiritual battle. Amen? Spiritual battles are taking place all around us. And so in that respect, we think of the song Onward Christian Soldiers. We are like soldiers in the army of the Lord. And a soldier should always be prepared. Always be prepared for battle. You don't know what's coming down the road this week. It may be a huge battle tomorrow that you face. It may be later on today. Amen. I hope that, hope that doesn't come your way, but it may. And it could be a, a battle with your health, a battle with your finances, a battle with uh, different relationships and all of that. Uh, so many different things it could be that come your way. So as a soldier in the army of the Lord, we ought to always be ready, always be prepared. A soldier has to be prepared for the battle, but a soldier also has to be prepared for inspection. Amen. It might be inspection time, right? Uh, when the sergeant or lieutenant or whoever walks in and everybody has to have their bed made and everything like that and, and ready and standing at attention and ready for inspection. You never know. You have to always be ready. So we're going to look at several points uh, about with that thought this morning as we go to Romans chapter 1 verses 14 and 15. As we read these verses, I want you to think about this. Always be ready to preach. Always be ready to preach. Romans chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, where the Apostle Paul says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Paul had prepared himself and was ready to go to Rome and to preach the gospel. And that is a thought that we must think about. We ought to be ready at all times, ready to preach, ready to give the gospel to anybody at any time. You never know what's going to happen, what's going to take place. And so as we, as God's people, ought to be ready to preach, ready to give the gospel. I heard a story about an evangelist years ago uh, that used to go to a town and uh, he was holding a revival at a certain place, and he would tell the pastor, I want you to make an appointment uh, with your bank president. Whatever your church does the banking, or you personally make an appointment with the president, I want to see the president of the bank. And so that evangelist would come to town, and uh, there would be an appointment made, set up for him to go to the bank. And he would go to the bank with the pastor, and he would meet the president of the bank, and all the greetings and everything, and then they would sit down together, and the evangelist would say, I made this appointment because I have a debt that I need to pay. Boy, that perked up the banker's ears. You know what I'm saying? I have a debt I have to pay, and that is to give you the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he would give them the gospel of Jesus Christ, and many times they would get saved and uh, come, to the, come to the services that week. We have a debt. As God's people, we have a debt to pay to give out the gospel. That's what he's talking about in verse 14 there. 
Paul says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and unwise. And what he's saying is, I am a debtor to every person. Whether they're Greek, that was the most cultured people of Paul's day, or the barbarians, <laughs> the most uncultured of his day. Whether to the wise or unwise, whether to the educated, highly educated, or the non-educated, the Apostle Paul says, I have a debt to pay, and I am ready to preach the gospel anytime, anywhere. You know, we have to remember we have a great debt to pay. To give the gospel out to the whole world. That's what Jesus left us here for, is to give the gospel to the whole world. That is the commission of the church, to preach the gospel to every creature. And we ought to preach the gospel not only with our lips, but also with our life. We should tell the gospel by what we say, but we should also live the gospel by how we live. I mean, if you say the gospel, you preach the gospel, but you don't live of the word of God and of the gospel, you are what the Bible calls a hypocrite. Don't be a hypocrite. Amen? The old song, and a song I heard years ago is, practice what you preach. Amen? That's a good statement. That's a good song. That's what we ought to do. I got this little article. It's called, You Preach First. Listen to this and think about it. The, ser the first sermon preached every Sunday is not by the minister, but by you. You preach a message of good cheer when you say good morning to those you meet as you are parking or in the hallway. You preach a message of hope and joy when you enthusiastically sing during the song service. You preach a message about power of prayer when you fervently enter into our time of prayer together. You preach a message about respect when you listen attentively while the special music is presented. You preach a message of love when you smile and say hello and introduce yourself to visitors. You preach a message about faith when you give your tithes and your offerings. You preach a message about the importance of the scripture when you open your Bible to today's text. Many messages are preached before the minister stands up to bring his message. If your message is positive and consistent, then the message given from the pulpit will be much better received. Come Sunday morning prepared to preach your best sermon. Amen? We all preach messages, not by just what we say, but how we live and how we act. How true that is. So the, the Bible says here, be ready. Be ready to preach. I want you to notice, secondly, turn over to the book of 1 Timothy. The book of 1 Timothy, chapter 6. 1 Timothy, chapter 6. I want you to notice the Bible says here, be ready to distribute. The Bible's talking about. And the Bible talking here about money in 1 Timothy, chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. He's talking about money. He's talking about giving and those type of things. Notice what he says in verse number 17. He says, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Boy, if there's one thing today that God's people need to understand is what verse 17 there says. Don't trust in uncertain riches. Amen? You look at the economy. <laughs> $100 a year ago would buy you more than $100 will today. So $100 is less than what it used to be worth. Why? Because money changes, right? Uh, you know, inflation and all of those things, I mean, it changes. So don't put your trust, as he says here, in uncertain riches, but where do you put your trust in verse 17? In the living God. <laughs> God never changes. Money goes up, money goes down, but God never changes. Learn to trust God and have faith in Him. Do not trust in uncertain riches. Look what it says in verse 18. That they do good, that they be rich in good works ready to distribute, 
willing to communicate. Here's where we find, be ready. Be ready to distribute, he's talking about. In your giving, be ready and willing to be a giver. Look for opportunities to give. We, have, uh, we give you a lot of opportunities here at our church. We have missionaries come in and different guest preachers, and we give you an opportunity to leave a love offering for them. You don't put your tithe there. Your tithe goes to the church, but you put an offering over and above your tithe to be a blessing to them, ready to distribute. Oh, how many times I've seen, since I've been at this church, I've seen how God has blessed certain ones. Some of you remember when I first got here, my first year here, during that year we had uh, one of our missionaries that this church has been supporting a long time, uh, Brother Rogers, came and and, uh, you know, pull up in the parking lot, preached, and we uh, gave him, uh, we, we always give an expense check from the church, and then we give him a love offering on top of that. And, uh, boy, the love offering came in and everything, it was good. People gave well, and I gave him that check and that love offering, and he called me the next day, and he said, I looked at how much was given, and he said, I actually had to rent a car to get here to preach that Sunday because my car broke down. And he said, I took it in to get it fixed, and it was exactly the amount you gave us on that Sunday to get my car fixed. I've seen that happen over and over and over again. How God blesses in that way. We ought to be, as God's people, we ought to always be ready to distribute. I have, you know, I've got some extra money in my wallet. Maybe God has somebody that needs something and I'm ready to distribute. I'm ready to give it out. I'm ready to help somebody else that's needy and that needs help. That is, we go on to verse 19 here in in 1 Timothy, uh, where are we? Chapter 6 here, verse 19. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation. What does that do when you're ready to give and ready to distribute? It lays a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life so that you'll have a full understanding of what God is doing in your life. It's a good foundation for us to be always ready to distribute. Be a giver. God loves a giver. God is a giver. And so we ought to be givers as God is, ready to distribute. Turn over just a couple of pages to the book of Titus. Just a couple of pages to the book of Titus. And looks, let's look at chapter 3. The next thing we find here, after we see ready to preach and ready to distribute, we see here in Titus chapter 3, ready to do good works. Look what he says. I'll read a few verses here. Let's start in verse 1. Titus 3, 1. The Bible says, "...put them in mind to be subject unto principalities and powers." to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be be no brawlers but gentle, showing all meekness unto men. He's starting to show us what these good works are. Verse (coughs) 3, excuse me, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Verse 6, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. What should we be ready for? As a Christian, as a saved person, we ought to be ready to do good works. Always be looking for opportunities, for good works, to help someone out. I remember some years ago when I pastored in Canada, I preached in, basically preached in uh, just, I'm trying to think now, every province and one of the territories in Canada. Um, One time a pastor asked me to come out to 
Newfoundland. Now, if you don't know where Newfoundland is, it's that island. kind of looks like a, a fist with a finger pointing up, kind of like this. There's Newfoundland and Labrador way out there on the East Coast. My wife is from Nova Scotia. If you go to Nova Scotia and you take a right and keep going and take a ferry boat eight hours, you'll get out to Newfoundland. And there's Newfoundland. Now, <clears throat> I used to say Newfoundland until I went to Newfoundland. You don't say Newfoundland. They know you're a visitor. You say Newfoundland. Okay? You got to say it right. So I went out to Newfoundland to preach and, and from one part of that island to go drive over to the other side is an eight-hour drive. Now, it doesn't look that big on the map. It's pretty big, though. And I preached in one place, and I went and preached in another place, and <clears throat> pastor drove me over, and I got with another pastor, and he took me, and, and uh, I, I think we had gone out to eat or something, and, and uh, we, we had dress clothes on, and, and uh, we were uh, done eating. We were driving to uh, where his church was located, where I was going to stay, and uh, we got on, we, we came out of the restaurant, we got on the highway, and uh, it was a wide open area there, and we started to drive, and there was a car sitting on the side of the road. And as soon as we pulled out, we started driving, we saw that car, and the, the pastor pulled right over. And he told me, in Newfoundland, if somebody's on the side of the road, you pull over. It used to be that way around here. But you can't do that anymore, right? You might get in big trouble, right? But in Newfoundland, it still is that way. And part of the reason is, is you help other people because in Newfoundland, you got to understand something about Newfoundland. Now, it was summertime there. But wintertime goes from about Labor Day till about Memorial Day, okay? That's wintertime, okay? It was summertime, nice warm day, about 55 degrees, you know beautiful day. Uh, people walking around in their shorts and stuff. But anyhow, <laughs> we're driving on. We pull off there, pull up behind this car. He gets out and I get out and we start up there and here's an older couple sitting there. You could tell they got a flat tire pulled over on the side. He walked up in his Newfoundland brogue and said, how's you doing, bye? That means, how are you doing? Okay. <laughs> and he said, uh, not too good, son. He said, look back there. And this old couple, he said, that's okay. I'm going to change your tire. He said, oh, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Here we are. Yeah, I mean, he had a tie on, dress shirt, and dress pants. And he gets out there and, and uh, I knew how to operate the jack. So I jacked the car up for him and he changed the tire, put the spare on and then put it all back and said, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> he said, well, you know, the man, the older couple there, the man said, well, who are you? Well, I'm a pastor. And because of that, we was able to give those folks the gospel. You know, we ought to be ready at all times, ready to help someone out and, and be a blessing to someone else. Who knows? I don't know. They, they didn't uh, profess Christ then, but maybe they read that track and maybe they got saved. I don't know, but we need to be ready. God gives us opportunities and so always be ready, not only for good works, as he says there in verse number one, be ready to every good work. But if you jump down where I read there in verse number eight, he says also to maintain good works. That means consistently uh, uh, maintaining good works, being a person of good works. That ought to be our testimony as a Christian. I'm ready. I'm ready to give the gospel. I'm ready to maintain good works. Notice, go back to chapter 2 and verse number 7 of Titus. Look what he says there. He says, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. He is talking to a young man in the ministry, the Apostle Paul is, and he's saying not only good works and maintaining good works, but he says there in verse number 7, a pattern of good works. In other words, it's not just do one a year. <laughs> Amen. It's a pattern. It ought to be the pattern of our lives as God's people. Be ready to do good works for those that need help. Get a chance to give the gospel and be a good testimony. Here's the next one. Go to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter. And look at chapter 3. Ready 
ready to preach, ready to distribute, ready to do good works, ready in 1 Peter chapter 3 to give an answer. Ready to give an answer. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verses 15 and 16. 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. Here's what the Bible says. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that, whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Here's what he's saying in verse 15. Be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. Now before that, in verse 15, he says this, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. The word sanctified means to, that God ought to have a special place of priority in our lives. As God's people, God ought to have a special place in your life. I know that in some ways I'm preaching to the choir here this morning. Why? Because you have come to church this morning. That shows me this. God has a special place in your life. Special enough to come to the house of God to hear the word of God. Amen? That is a good thing. And so we ought to set God aside as a special place in our life. And then he says to be ready always at all times... Be ready to give an answer to every man. Be ready to give an answer. Of the reason for the hope that is in you. That is basically just witnessing. Be ready to give an answer. What if somebody asks you, why do you act the way you do? Why do you go to church on Sunday? What are you going to say to them? You say, well, you know, I grew up that way. And my parents always did it. And so I, that's what I do. Boy, if that's the only reason, that's pretty weak. Why do you come to church? Why do you hear the Word of God preach? Why? Why? What is the reason that there is hope in your heart? I hope you can tell them this, because Jesus saved my soul and gave me a home in heaven. And I want to live for Him after all He's done for me. I want to do something for Him. I want to live for Him. Answer. Give an answer. Be ready, the, Bi the, the Bible says. Here's an old song I found out of a hymn book, and I, I thought of it as I was studying this week, and, and I had to search a couple of hymn books to find this song. You know what the title of this song is? Ready. That's it. It's just ready. I, I haven't sung it a lot, but I've sung it a few times in churches. And here's what the song says, ready to suffer grief or pain, ready to stand the test, ready to stay at home and send others if he sees best, ready to go, ready to stay, ready my place to fill, ready for service, lowly or great, ready to do his will. The last verse says, ready to speak, ready to warn, ready or souls to yearn. Ready in life, ready in death, ready for His return. The chorus repeats, ready to go, ready to stay, ready my place to fill. Ready for service, lowly or great, ready to do His will. You know, God's people ought to be ready at all times. Are you ready to give an answer? If someone asks you of the reason of hope that is in you, the Bible says. Are you ready to give an answer at all times? Just the other day, I was, I think it was last week, I was visiting Brother Cleveland at the hospital and um, he hadn't had his surgery yet. It was before his surgery. Let me back up here. No, that was, I'm wrong on, the, on when that was. It was, um, I'm getting old folks, be patient with me. You know what I'm talking about, right? It was during VBS and I went to see Brother Lazier. That's who it was. Uh, because he got, you know the story, he got bit by the cat and all of that. And so I went to see him in the hospital. <clears throat> when I came out of the hospital, I came down and there was a family there and I was able to give them a VBS flyer, invite them and bring the kids to Vacation Bible School. And I walked out and uh, 
uh, I had some tracks in my hand already and there was a young man and I handed him a track and invited him to church and headed toward my vehicle and he called me. He said, hey, hey, can I, can I ask you something? And I went back to him and started talking to him and was able to witness Jesus Christ to him. Now he didn't get saved, but he promised me he was going to come to church. I'm still waiting. <laughs> Hasn't been here yet. But God was working on his heart. And so be ready at any time. You never know what's going to happen, who you're going to talk to and what's going on. In his life, uh, he just had, uh, uh, his wife just had a baby that was born and, and he was nervous about it and he was, you know, anxious about it. And I talked a little bit about that, but I gave him the gospel, ready to answer. The Bible says there in, in uh, 1 Peter 3, 15, he said, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. With the right attitude and with the right help, people need help today. You ought to be someone that wants to help others. And if you look for opportunities, you'll find opportunities. People need help today. Ready. Ready. Here's the last one. I want you to go to the book of Luke. The book of Luke and go to chapter 12. Point number five, Luke chapter 12, verses 35 through 40. The last one is this, ready for the Lord's return. Ready. Ready to preach, ready to distribute, ready to do good works, ready to give an answer, but ready for the Lord's return. Hey friend, today, Jesus is coming soon. Well, I'm glad two people, my two deacons said amen. They believe that. Jesus is coming soon. Amen. He is. He is. And He's coming. Look what it says in Luke chapter 12. Jesus is speaking here. Starting verse 35. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. What is He talking about? Being ready. And you yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself, and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so blessed are those servants. Verse 39, And this know, that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched, and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also. For the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. All of these verses before verse 40, Jesus was giving illustrations of being ready. Why should they be ready? And what time? At the end of verse 36, he says immediately. And then he comes down to verse number 40. He says, be ye therefore, because of that, because of what I said, be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Notice there in verse 37, if you're ready and watching, verse 37, you are blessed. It also repeats that in verse number 38. If you're ready for the Lord's return and you're watching for the Lord's return and you're saying to yourself, Jesus could come today. He could come today. Are you ready? Are you watching for Him and looking with great anticipation? I can't wait for the day when He busts through those clouds and calls us up out of here. Wow, I'm, I'm ready with anticipation. I'm looking forward to the day when Jesus comes. Many times I will sing to myself that song that we sang at the hymn sing. I led it in the hymn sing, Christ Returneth. And I'll sing to myself, Oh, Lord Jesus, 
How long, how long, ere we shout the glad song, Christ returneth, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, amen. I'm looking forward to Jesus coming again. That's the reason for the hope that is in my heart. That's why I'm ready to preach and ready to distribute and ready to, to do good works and all of those things. Because why? Because Jesus is coming again. And I'm looking forward to that day. Listen, we need to be prepared. We need to be ready to go. Like, uh, like uh, back in the history of our country, there was a group called the Minutemen. They were ready to fight off the British at any second. When they went to bed at night, they left their clothes laying out there ready to go so that when the bell sounded or the, or the warning sound sounded, they could jump up out of bed, put those clothes on, and be ready in one minute to go out and fight the enemy. Hey, we ought to be ready that way. Be prepared. Why? Because we do not know when he shall return. We don't know. That's what Jesus says here. He'll come in an hour when you think not. Have your loins girded in verse 35. He said, have your loins girded. That means be ready for action. Ready all the time. I remember when growing up and uh, my, my brother had surrendered to preach and he preached his first sermon when he was 12 and then uh, it wasn't long after that I surrendered to preach and, and I was 12 years old when I preached my first sermon and and uh, later on, as we grew a little bit older, and, and we got opportunities to preach once in a while here and there, and then when we started to travel on the road with my dad full time, and uh, all of that, uh, dad said, now, boys, I want you to know something. I want you to be ready to preach at any time. Ready to preach. And we're like, really? He said, yeah, you never know. When you get an opportunity, uh, be ready to preach. So, okay, okay, Dad. Well, you know how teenagers are. You know how teenagers are? <laughs> right? We didn't get ready. I remember one Sunday morning, <clears throat> we lived in a 35-foot fifth-wheel trailer. And we're getting ready. We have these dividers. We're getting ready for church in the morning. Have these dividers. And, and uh, some were getting dressed here and some were getting... My brother and I were up in, our, in the crow's nest there <laughs> and we're getting ready that Sunday morning. And Dad says... Hey, boys, by the way, you're preaching in the teen class this morning. <laughs> and we looked at each other. <gasps> Dad, you didn't tell. I told you, always be ready. Okay. Boy, did we scramble that morning. I mean, I didn't get my hair combed too well because I wasn't worried about my hair. I was worried about getting things. I wish I had this haircut. I mean, I, I love this haircut. You don't have to worry. I'm always ready. Amen? At a moment's notice. Amen? But anyhow, <laughs> oh, we had to scramble and get ready because we're preaching. And he did that to us over and over. I mean, several times. I, Dad, I, I got to the place where I said, Dad, when did you know that we were going to preach to the teenagers at this church? Well, I knew it last week. I mean, why didn't you tell us last week? Well, I don't know. I forgot about it. You know, you know what we learned? Always be ready. Always be ready. I worked for a pastor when I was an assistant that had bad health problems. And sometimes he would call me on Sunday morning and say, I can't get out of bed. I'm not going to be able to make it. Guess who had to be ready? See, I learned that when I was a teenager. Learned that ready to get up and preach. Ready at all times. God help us to be prepared. Ready to go. Ready to do His will. Is your house in order? Are you ready for Jesus to return? Are you ready to face Him? It could be today that you would face Him. Be ready. Jesus prepared salvation in heaven for us. Are you ready for His return? Are you saved? Are you born again? Are you ready to, to go up when He calls us out of here? Boy, if you're not saved, you need to get ready. 
You need to get saved today. And don't put it off any other time. You say, well, I'm not sure today is, uh, you know, is the time. No, it is. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. There's nothing you need to do or whatever. You need to come and get saved. Be born again. Hey, Christian, are you ready? We need to be prepared. We need to be ready. I want to finish with this story. You ever heard of Sultan Muhammad Ibn Daud? Probably not. But if you are from Iran, you would consider the Sultan to be a combination of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. Sultan Daud ruled the country between the Tigris and Oxus River, and he did it well. He extended his nation's borders. He, he brought riches and prosperity prosperity to his people. Of course, Sultan Daud did not live forever. As often happens for a man who is bigger than reality, when Daud died, it didn't take long before stories, myths, and legends latched onto his life. Soon it was difficult to distinguish between the truth and a myth. That is why when it was rumored that the sultan would someday rise again and lead his people to new victories and greater riches, it was decided the nation ought to be kept in a state of readiness. Part of those preparations involved having a horse ready and raring to go for when the ruler arose. Beginning in the year that he died, 1072, A series of saddled horses were kept standing at the sultan's tomb for more than 500 years. Ready. Ready. Of course, that sultan, he's not going to rise from the dead. There's only one that rose from the dead. And that's our Savior, Jesus Christ. You know what Jesus says to all of his people, all of his followers, all of the saved, all of the born again, all of his disciples that know him as Lord and Savior, be ready. That's what he tells us. Be ready. Hey, Christian, are you ready? Are you ready to preach? Witness to someone? Ready to distribute? Ready to give out the gospel? Are you ready? If you're here without Christ today, are you ready for the Lord's return? You can make yourself ready today. You can come to Christ and be saved and be ready to meet Him. Christian, maybe you should come to this altar and say, Lord, help me to be ready. Ready in doing your work, doing your will, that I might be ready to meet you when you return.